at undermining the democratic process. Well, does the accusation make sense? Will they take more actions against either Hong Kong or the mainland? How should China respond? And how should governments deal with the special circumstances brought about by the pandemic? To talk about these issues and more, I'm joined by Lawrence Ma, barrister and chairman of Hong Kong Legal Exchange Foundation, Dr. Edward Tse, founder and CEO of Galphone Advisory Company, and Andy Mark, senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, the Legislative Council elections in Hong Kong uh, were postponed for a year over COVID-19 and concerns. L let me start with you, Lawrence. What do you think of the decision and the justification for the postponement? Well, as, as you understand, the term for the Legislative Council uh, in Hong Kong is normally four years. That's in Article 69 of the Basic Law. Now, when the Basic Law is drafted, it was supposed to, or Article 69 at least, is supposed to operate in, quote, peacetime, unquote. Now, Hong Kong is now having a national or regional emergency um, of, of public health. So Article 69, the term of the Legislative Council, has to be construed in the context of the current regional emergency. So as a result, it is necessary and practically require for the term to be extended beyond the COVID, possible COVID-19 finishes so that to enable a, uh, the voting to occur without harming or injuring anyone uh, because of COVID-19. So the legal justification comes from um, the power of, of interpretation of the basic law. The National People's Congress Standing Committee has the constitutional power under the Chinese Constitution, Article 67, as well as under Article 158 of the Basic Law to interpret, to finally and ultimately interpret a provision of the Basic Law, which includes Article 69, to extend uh, its term to beyond four years. I believe uh, you mentioned uh, current emergency. That means the COVID-19 risks. But how, uh, what kind of a challenge has COVID-19 uh, posed to, for example, election of uh, uh, councillors and, and legislative council members? Well, obviously, people have to run their campaign if the ele election is to allow to go on. At least they have to run the campaign. The candidates would have to contact and visit many of the uh, electors, the voters, and there would be building visits. They have to go through each and every building in their electors to persuade their voters, to give them to have contact with them to persuade them to give them the votes. That's the first thing. The second thing is on the day of voting, people have to queue up. There's no um, electronic voting as such in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. So people have to queue up in a long queue and there, there will be intimate, um, very close physical contact between electors. So it would be very dangerous for that to happen. And don't worry, uh, do, do not remember, uh, forget that Hong Kong is now having a double digit um, infection rate of COVID-19 in Hong Kong every day. And, and Edward, uh, have you talked to Hong Kong people or some of them? Uh, what do they feel about uh, the situation they are in? Uh, are they uh, in a rush to vote or they would rather wait for a year uh, un uh, until the COVID is contained? Well, no, no one is yeah, in Hong Kong now is concerned with voting. Yeah, sorry. E Edward? Yeah, as always, there's a range of opinions in Hong Kong these days on this kind of issues. Uh, but I think this issue, based on my interactions with the Hong Kongers, has been less, uh, what should I say, politically sensitive versus the, some of the previous issues, you know, like the, the national security law, or for that matter, you know, earlier the uh, so-called universal suffrage uh, of Hong Kong and so on and so forth. At this time, it seems to me that most of the Hong Kong people would accept the decision to delay the election for one year simply because of the concerns about public health, because it's affecting everybody. Mm. And Lawrence, as a result, the Standing Committee of the NBC, that's China's top legislative body, 
has just passed a resolution to extend the term of the current LECCO, the sixth LECCO. Is that the best solution to fill the year-long gap? Because, as I understand, uh, some of the lawmakers is being disqualified for seeking re-election. Well, the, yes, well, but the, the disqualification only applies to the term after this term. It doesn't apply to this current term. And the extension is an extension of the current term. So all of these um, legislative councillors, although they would be or might be disqualified for the next term, they would still have position and office, a valid office, in this term for the coming year. So there wouldn't be no problem for them to continue to stand and represent their electors. So uh, they will the stay year. on the Legislative Council until the next election? All of them? That's right. A yes. and, and Andy, uh, the foreign ministers of the United States, uh, United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, uh, the Five I uh, Coalition, issued a, a, a statement Sunday saying that this gravely concerned by the Hong Kong government's unjust disqualification of candidates and this disproportionate postponement of legislative council elections. So they mean that postpone the election by one year is inappropriate. Uh, how do you interpret the statement by the Five Eyes? Well, I think it's uh, an interesting statement, Zhou Yue. And, of course, many in the West, uh, including the Five Eyes countries, have a kind of a fetish for elections and think of them as an ends in themselves. So, and they are perhaps naive in this respect, but we need to remember that the goal of an election, an election is only a tool, and government is a tool to deliver better lives for the people that they govern. And as long as that we keep that in mind. I think we have to have a certain amount of flexibility whenever any problems come up, a health crisis, other types of issues, that uh, a good government is flexible. But I think also uh, some in the West, and I think certainly some in the Five Eyes as well, uh, know this to be true, but also are using this uh, as a way to stir up trouble or to unfairly uh, criticize both Hong Kong and China. And considering the fact that more than 60 countries and regions have actually postponed elections this year because of the pandemic, and even in the United States, President Trump raised the issue of postponing the election. Why Hong Kong was picked out uh, and, and blamed for postponing of the election? Andy? So uh, clearly, um, the U.S. and the four other eyes uh, have I think banded together uh, vigilante style, uh, looking to stir up a lynch mob against China. And I think they see Hong Kong uh, as one promising area for this. I mean, we've seen uh, with the protests that have morphed into riots and uh, violence and looting, uh, et cetera, that I think this is, we can't look at this in isolation, but this is part of a broader uh, initiative or campaign of hostility uh, against China more generally. And, and about the local politics, Edward, uh, there are suspicions that maybe one year down the road the political sentiment will be more in favor of pro-Beijing camp. I is that a legitimate uh, thinking? There is certainly speculation of that, but I would say there's also expectation in some camps of the people here in Hong Kong that the sentiment will also go the other way. It's very difficult, I think, for anyone to have a precise prediction of how the sentiment would actually turn out one year from now. A lot of things would happen, uh, and we don't know exactly. But I think to put the public health above you know, the, the short-term political concerns is the right thing to do. And who knows what's going to happen you know, 12 months down the line. And also, Lawrence, uh, is one year uh, postponement an arbitrary decision? Why one year? Why not a month, a uh, half a year, or, or, or two years? Well, uh, I'm not a member of the uh, standing committee of the National People's Congress, but I think that they have um, uh, analyzed that the situation 
of COVID-19 would definitely come to an end within one year. Because as you understand, China is developing its vaccine and it is at a stage of being tested and it is very prosperous for that to be effective. And there's a team of uh, medical experts uh, from the mainland China now in Hong Kong, helping Hong Kong to resolve the current double-digit um, COVID-19 infection problem. Mm. So I would be confident, I think the central government would be confident that this COVID-19 would definitely finish within a year. And another thing also happened uh, Monday, that is uh, Hong Kong police uh, arrested seven people on charges of violating uh, Hong Kong's new national security law on Monday. Uh, Lawrence, uh, what is your uh, knowledge about the charges against them and, and what legal actions, uh, what legal grounds are, are, are they uh, being uh, taken on? Lawrence? Well, if you, if, you read, uh, yes, if you read Article 29 of the um, National Security Law, you understand that in Article 29, anyone conspires with a, with a foreign country to impose sanctions or to engage in other hostile activities against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region or the People's Republic of China, um, that is a criminal offense, punishable, uh, maximum would be life imprisonment. So um, as a result, the, as you understand, the seven uh, the people who were arrest, arrested includes um, uh, Jimmy Lai of Apple Daily. Mm -hmm. Now those people are really behind or the, they, they are the proxies of American governments in Hong Kong, in local, to coordinate, to fund, to support, and to um, um, incite people to come out to protest. Um, this is a, a no one secret. Um, so, and after the passing of the national security law, they do not stop. They continue to re to, uh, to, to coordinate activities and to uh, receive fundings to um, uh, call on the American government particularly and other governments, Western governments, to impose sanctions on Hong Kong. So they were arrested, I believe, on that charge under Article 29, Subsection 4. And do you agree, Edward, because uh, uh, the national security law for Hong Kong has uh, specifically said it, it shouldn't uh, punish those uh, retrospectively? Edward? Okay, we may lost our audio with Edward. Let's come back to uh, Lawrence. What do you think of the laws? Yes. Uh, capabilities of the, punishing the law, those yes. retrospectively. It, yes. Is this the, punishing the, their the previous uh, offenses or the offenses after uh, the passing of the law? It was to punish the aftermath of, of, after, uh, of their acts after the passing of the law. Um, the law definitely doesn't have retrospective effect. It was stated in the law itself that the law does not have retro retrospective or retroactive effect. So, but the problem is these people, the seven who were arrested, continue to offend and continue to engage in, criminalizing, in criminal, criminal acts, notwithstanding the passing of the law, as if they wanted to be either um, uh, to test out the, 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 the full vigor of the law, or they really want to um, continue um, their acts uh, against the government as well as the region for their own political purpose. Mm. Let's talk about the high-profile arrest of Jimmy Lai. You just mentioned that. Uh, he was among the people arrested. He had been arrested twice this year. Uh, but how will the arrest different this time? Will be the charges be different because of the passing of the national security law? Well, the, he was, the old charge was he was uh, inciting people to participate in riots beforehand. Um, it was the um, anti-fugitive um, amendment bill um, campaign, which that happened last year. But for this charge and for today, well, yesterday's arrest, it was on a different charge. It was for uh, a charge that would, uh, under Article 29 of the, of the national security law, which people have asked foreign governments to sanction mm. or impose a blockade um, on, on the current Hong Kong uh, region or the, uh, or the um, People's Republic of China. So the two charges are different. They are under two different laws. So does that and mean he are, will not be able to get bailed out this time? 
it would be more, more difficult because under the current national security law, I think it's Article 62.2, um, the court has to be satisfied that the suspect would not reoffend if he is granted bail. So if the suspect or the applicant for the bail, which is Jimmy Lai, who cannot prove that he, to the satisfaction of the court, that he would not go out after bail to reoffend or commit criminal offenses of this nature, then the court could grant him bail. But mm -hmm. if the court is not comfortable that he would not go out and reoffend during his bail period, the court would have no discretion, and there is an obligation on the court not to grant bail. Mm -hmm. Uh, this has caught a lot of international media attention, Andy, uh, because of the arrests of um, Jimmy Lai and also Agnes Cho, uh, the, the activist in the protest movement. Uh, a lot of people are asking, uh, will the enforcement of national security law serve the purpose of uh, limiting people's freedom of expression in Hong Kong? What, what do you think? Well, I think it clearly has had an impact, uh, Zhou Yue, and the way it's portrayed in the Western media is entirely negative. But we need to remember that in any society, uh, citizens have rights, but with those rights also come obligations. So just as if you yell fire in a crowded uh, movie theater, uh, there are typically repercussions for that. So I think that uh, there is a greater awareness, there's a greater responsibility now uh, in Hong Kong where I think people need to consider both their rights as well as their obligations and the potential penalties of saying things that can be damaging to society, uh, to Hong Kong society, or damaging to uh, national security. Mm. And, and Edward, uh, uh, we're talking about the arrest of uh, Mr. Lau and, uh, and also Ms. Uh, Zhou in Hong Kong. What, do, what is the public opinion in Hong Kong uh, regarding the arrests of those uh, high-profile uh, protest movement uh, heads? Yeah, as, as expected, the, uh, the views in Hong Kong are quite extreme. The, uh, the people who are so-called, you know, uh, pandems or people who are supportive of the rights and the protests since last year were really uh, uh, condemning this move by the by the police. However, there are people, the large number of people in Hong Kong, who really are, are frustrated and, frankly, at this time, uh, very tired of all the uh, uh, unrest that uh, happened since the last year. Uh, really applauded this move by the police because uh, many of the Hong Kongers do see uh, certainly uh, Jimmy Lai as a, a source of many of the uncertainty and uh, frankly a lot of unrest in Hong Kong. And so, you know, seeing the police taking the move uh, is, uh, is, is uh, seen as a positive move by uh, many of the Hong Kongers. Uh, but Lawrence, uh, we still don't understand uh, what kind of charges will be pressed against him and what will happen uh, to the m media that he owned because after the arrest, uh, the officers also raided Next Digital and Apple Daily's headquarters. Uh, what will happen to the tabloid newspaper and what responsibilities does the media organization have? Well, I think they are pretty robust. I mean, if you see today's Apple Daily, um, there are people in Hong Kong who has been oversubscribing and buying up all the newspapers in Hong Kong in support of Apple Daily. That is pretty true. And mm. also, there is the, the stock price of Apple Daily rocket high today. It, it jumped at, what, 200 or, or 300 percent from, from cents to two dollars. I think it would be... Um, I, 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 I'm not an economist, I can't interpret this, but this is the fact of how people seem to be, pay sympathies to, to uh, Apple Daily upon their arrest. So it would be very difficult to guess what will happen, but for Jimmy Lai, I think it is, I think that the police would have concrete evidence or pretty cogent evidence um, on the offense that he has committed, which is, you know, inciting or, sorry, not inciting, but he, he has asked foreign governments to come, impose sanctions in Hong Kong. Um, so th this is pretty clear. He has personally admitted to those, and we have video clips, a, a number of them, that he speaks to the media 
inviting the American government to come and impose sanctions against Hong Kong officials. This is a not this is a pretty pretty normal to everyone in Hong Kong. So it, it would be it would be difficult for me to say that he would be acquitted um, mm. from the charge, facing with the evidence that that is now uh, uh, against him by, by by the prosecution. But don't you think his trial will also be a test of Hong Kong's uh, judicial system because it is supposed to be a legal matter, but now more and more it has become a political matter uh, that is thought of differently uh, between China and the West. Well, well, that's true, but therefore we there is a chance that the jury system is to be done away because we don't want this to be a trial by the press, for example, because in America, for example, the O.J. Simpson trial, as you all know, he's a famous uh, boxer, and then his trial, he was acquitted for murdering his wife, not because he was not found guilty, but because the, he, the, the, he was, there was a trial by media. The, the, oh, the jury were, were, were contaminated, the mind of the jury were contaminated, in, as such that the jury could not find a, give a fair verdict. So in this case, we do not want a trial by media. There would be a trial by a single judge mm -hmm. who would have immunity towards, towards all these news in, in the media. He would focus on the evidence and determine whether the evidence is proven up to scratch the charge. And if so, he would be convicted. But there is obviously international uh, ramifications. Uh, the U.S. Treasury has imposed sanctions on Hong Kong Chief Executive Carrie Lam and 10 other top officials from Hong Kong and also the Chinese mainland in charge of Hong Kong affairs. I'm blaming them for undermining Hong Kong's autonomy. Uh, so, Andy, what impact will these sanctions have on these officials? And uh, do you think it will have any real impact on Hong Kong and, and mainland? I think these sanctions in particular uh, most likely will not. I mean, we've seen uh, the defiance from Carrie Lam. I believe she called these sanctions uh, shameful and despicable. Um, but I'd like to go back very briefly uh, to the point about what might happen to next digital media. Um, I believe uh, wasn't uh, Jimmy Lai also charged on suspicion of financial fraud as well, and if that involves his company, that could have uh, consequences uh, there as well. And I think how this relates then to the sanctions is that uh, there is a question of law, there is a question of justice, but these types of issues do have a political dimension and they also have a geopolitical dimension as well, in that we know that the U.S. has a long history uh, where it is able to uh, interfere with domestic decisions. And I think what this shows is that when China was poor and weak, it also had to consider these factors. But today, China can make these decisions uh, based on uh, justice, the legal system, and from a national perspective, because it is strong enough to stand up to the U.S. Mm -hmm. But obviously, it, it will uh, draw a wedge between Hong Kong and the U.S. Uh, and Edward, uh, China also says it condemns the sanctions against the officials of the government, central government and Hong Kong government, and it retaliated by imposing sanctions on Americans, 11 American politicians, uh, for behave, behaving badly on Hong Kong-related issues. This kind of a uh, tit-for-tat, uh, will, do you think it will hurt Hong Kong in, in some way? Well, unfortunately, um, uh, it, it could, uh, but, but be it as it may, uh, because it was really the U.S. government who who has started the the sanctions, and uh, you know, in the tit for tat uh, format, the Chinese government had to uh, had to retaliate. Uh, I personally do not hope this will further you know create ad additional sanctions, but you never know what the next step of the U.S. government is going to be. And uh, even though you know, as Carrie Lam said, you know, she doesn't really care about this sort of sanctions. But in my view, any sanctions is not a good, good thing to do. And I really hope uh, no more of such sanctions would happen. Because um, if, if the U.S. will continue to apply pressure on this, does that mean Hong Kong will run away from the U.S. economically 
and probably getting much closer to the mainland in economic and financial areas. Uh, it could, but you know, I think you know, we, we discussed this a little bit previously already. I can't remember whether it's Lawrence or Andy who has said, essentially, so far, you know, whatever the U.S. have, you know, uh, taken to try to, you know, sanction or, or um, uh, sort of to, to uh, penalize Hong Kong, so far, we don't see a whole lot of impact realistically on Hong Kong. But, you know, in, addition, you know, in, in the future, would the U.S. pull any additional more stringent, you know, measures to try to hurt Hong Kong? I don't know. But so far, we don't, I, I certainly don't see any major impact on the Hong Kong business, nor the American business who is doing business in Hong Kong, because of the fundamental underpin that Hong Kong continues to do well as a financial hub for the region, if not for the rest of the world. So, um, you know, let's, talk, let's, let's hope, you know, nothing more will happen in this direction, but you never know. And Andy, uh, what is Hong Kong's role in the grand rivalry between China and the United States, which has been playing out in full uh, display in, in recent months? No, I completely agree with Edward that you know, one can only hope that the seven million people of Hong Kong uh, really do not suffer anymore, including the businesses there as well, and all of mm. the uh, financial infrastructure, because they really are being held hostage and they're becoming the collateral damage as the U.S. Uh, ramps up its uh, campaign of hostility uh, towards China. And what, what else do you think those Western countries who have expressed uh, strong dissatisfaction over what is happening in Hong Kong can do uh, down the road? Well, I think the Western countries that are aligned with the U.S. in attacking China and attacking Hong Kong actually are becoming uh, increasingly impotent because we look at China's growing middle class, how attractive it is as a market and an investment destination, that Hong Kong will continue to be important because of its unique status, its history, uh, the institutional memory, uh, all of the uh, things that really makes it uh, the uh, one gateway to China. And I think mm -hmm. that that will not diminish. And other countries uh, see the opportunity as well. And Lawrence, the U.S. and some European countries have spoken a lot about Hong Kong's issues, but clearly they say one country, two systems principle is challenged. Uh, what is your understanding of the principle? Is still uh, strong and sturdy in Hong Kong? Of course, the one country, two system principle is a political term um, which is coming from the Sino-British Joint Declaration. And the Sino-British Joint Declaration terms has been fully written in the basic law. And the basic law actually is a legal protection of the of citizens' rights and, and an implementation of the Sino-British Joint Declaration. So the the, as long as the basic law is still enforceable in mm. place and honored, there is the one country, two system principle here in operation vividly in every corner of Hong Kong. All right. And also, I, they, the Western power was what, what, what are they expecting is they expected a, an independent Hong Kong instead of a highly autonomous Hong Kong, mm. which is definitely not the one country, two system is designed for Hong Kong to be. And probably uh, none on in Hong Kong and on the mainland can accept. Thank you very much, Lawrence, Edward, and Andy, for your insights.